that. All right, just uh, give it a moment. Okay, so while we're waiting on Maryland Delegate Karen Tolles, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start off with a presentation from our education policy analyst at the Council of State Governments, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is gonna talk about the current state of K through 12 education or what you know basically um elementary middle and high school level education what that all looks like in america today how state legislatures are responding to that uh you know what they're doing uh, especially as state legislatures are coming up on new sessions in the new year so andrew go ahead and take it away and then after andrew we'll head into our policy discussion our roundtable discussion uh, from our experts, um, as we uh, who will be joining us, uh, we have one who will be joining us shortly. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hi, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. So, as Charles mentioned, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm a policy analyst at the Council of State Governments and staff liaison for the CSG East Education and Workforce Development Committee. Before we dive into the panel discussion, Charles was kind enough to allow me a few minutes to briefly introduce myself and the CSG East Education and Workforce Development Committee and highlight a few things we've been working on and observing regarding student performance and policy. So just as a refresher or for anyone who is new to the Council of State Governments, we are a nonpartisan organization of state officials from all three branches of state government that provides a forum for members of any party affiliation to share best practices. We do not advocate for or against specific legislation and with that, the CSG East Education and Workforce Development Committee is here to support all members with research and topics of interest uh, and a topic of interest to many of our members over the last few years has been addressing declines in student achievement, specifically since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of you are likely familiar with the recent data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, known as the Nation's Report Card or the NAEP. The NAEP's recent long-term trend assessment for scores showed historic declines for 9- and 13-year-olds, with math and reading having the lowest scores in decades. Other NAEP assessments indicate historic declines in civics, which declined for the first time in the assessment's history, and U.S. history, which declined 9 points since 2014. While the data shows declines across demographics and across the country, the data shows even higher declines among individual populations. Students who historically perform lower saw larger drops in their higher achieving peers. Minority students as well are seeing higher performance declines compared to white peers. And amid these declines, CSG East members and the CSG East Education and Workforce Development Committee have put a lot of attention on this topic. In 2022, we held a session on addressing learning loss from the COVID-19 pandemic at the CSG East annual meeting. We've been conducting research on that topic since, developing analysis of how states are addressing COVID-19 learning loss and seeking to improve educational outcomes for students. Both, state and, both regionally and nationally, states are funding and implementing strategies such as tutoring and expanded learning time in an effort to increase student outcomes. Additionally, we've been seeing a sharp focus on literacy, specifically in the early years, pre-kindergarten through third grade. With that, we'll be having an article in CSG East's upcoming annual edition of Perspective, Perspectives, highlighting literacy and the work being done to improve these outcomes. So I encourage you all to check that out once it's released. Looking ahead, we're anticipating a heightened focus on addressing math and chronic absenteeism. Many states have been putting a lot of attention into implementing uh, and improving reading performance but are now shifting towards math as those recent scores highlight more concern on that um, as a subject area. Similarly, the NAEP has highlighted that absenteeism is on the rise and a recent analysis shows a potential association between chronic absenteeism and performance declines, highlighting that 45% of fourth grade readings three point decline is associated with absenteeism. All that to say, we are ultimately a member-driven organization. So if you are working on these topics in your respective jurisdictions or have other education policy questions, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and assist you in finding the resources that you need. And I'll pop my email in the chat as well. Thank you all. 
All right. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much. Really appreciate that overview. Um, that's something that's definitely essential and needed. So, uh, you know, once again, uh, you can contact Andrew directly. If you have more questions, you, you, you're also in need of that data. Uh, Andrew is a wealth of information, especially on the, on this space. Uh, he left his email in the chat, ajohnson at csg.org. Uh, once again, the education policy analyst uh, for the Council of State Governments uh, based uh, down in Lexington. So, uh, you know, thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, once again, appreciate you joining us uh, at, at the top. So, hey, Andrew, real quick question. Um, I, I know you were talking about absenteeism rates. Um, I've been reading uh, quite a bit in the news about homelessness and also bullying rates. I, I've been saying that. And I, I haven't noticed that uh, in recent years, but now in recent weeks, I'm starting to see more of that. Are you are you reading more on that? Are you hearing more of that from policymakers and, you know, kind of dealing with also high homelessness rates among K through 12 students, also bullying rates, also skyrocketing in school districts? Um, a little bit, yeah. We, um, specifically on the bullying, that's, we, we've had a few requests on that. Um, we've been, you know, requests for information on how states are approaching that, um, right. approaching, you know, bullying within schools. We haven't um, had an opportunity to dive too deep into it as a holistic topic, other than looking at specific um, issues around that. But that, again, is a topic if if you all in your states are working on that, by all means, let us know and we'll we'll do what we can to to provide research on that. Yeah, one other question too, before we head to our, our uh, esteemed guest, um, questions regarding uh, new, well, here's two questions, you try a question here. One, are you noticing and are you getting more questions on trends? And, and I'm gonna be asking panelists about this, um, but are you noticing and getting more questions from policymakers about trends and uh, how families are deciding to uh, look for alternative education options um, compared to you know the districts that they're assigned to? So whether they be uh, uh, you know publicly funded or charter school options or homeschooling, uh, I, I had saw like about a month ago a Washington Post analysis uh, showing that more and more families are choosing homeschooling over over every other uh out uh, k through 12 option right so are you are you getting more are you getting like queries from policymakers who are curious about that to date i have not had uh formal questions on that i've seen uh you know contemporary discussions around that similar to what you just mentioned about uh the rise and shift in in that temperature if you will yeah. Um, but we haven't had anything specific come in right now, but that I'm sure, as you mentioned, this is a new, newly developing thing. So I'm sure we'll start to get more and more as, as that, uh, continues to go and evolve. Can, can you hold on with us, um, throughout, uh, the, the course of our conversation, Andrew? So, cause I'm, I'm sure we might, in case, if, if you want to add any, any sort of, uh, thoughts, uh, to, to what our experts are saying, or maybe one of their questions at the end, when we open it up and we hear from. Uh, any of um, any of our audience that's joining us, um, but I appreciate that if you can hang on. So we're going to head to our roundtable. Uh, we have joining us um, current Maryland State Delegate Karen Toll. She's also Vice Chair of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus, uh, based in Annapolis, Maryland. Of course, uh, Maryland State Capitol is Annapolis, uh, so Delegate Tolls is joining us um, and she happens to be an educator. She's not K through 12 education, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, she teaches at um, Bowie State University, which is um, a noted historically black college and university. So she joins us. Uh, always good to see you delegate. Thanks for joining. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, so, and uh, also joining us is former Colorado Senate president uh, and nationally renowned K through 12 education expert, Peter Groff. Uh, Peter Groff now joins. He also <clears throat> teaches a course in public policy, a master's level course in public policy at the University of Redlands. Uh, so he's joining us today uh, to talk a bit about this topic, and uh, he knows it very well. Uh, so uh, once again, just reminding everyone that's sitting in, that's watching this, this session is being recorded. Uh, we will be providing it uh, on a number of platforms, including, including our own website. Uh, and so many people will be seeing it later on, very soon, very shortly, uh, this conversation. And I just wanted to let everyone know. So keep that in mind uh, as you're 
joining us today and when you ask questions later on. Okay, and Delegate Tolls, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, what keeps you up at night when you think about the state of K through 12 education, you know, especially in a state like Maryland? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, first of all, thank you so much, Charles, for having me be a part of this uh, very important discussion. Um, I am always trying to find ways to, uh, you know, give as much knowledge, knowledge as I can as a public servant. Um, and also as an adjunct professor. So thank you so much for having me and for your partnership that we have together um, with CSG and, and throughout the state of Maryland. Um, and so what really keeps me up at night is really the crime that we see with our young people um, mm -hmm. in our schools. When I was in school, I did not have to worry about you know, ducking or doing some other issue or, you know, other than fire drill, that's all we had. But the fact that we're seeing so much crime in our schools, um, I'm putting a bill in to look at how something as simple as bus drivers knowing CPR and how to render aid. We had a situation here where um, some middle school students was looking for another middle school student and came on the bus with a gun. And unfortunately it jammed up and those students were not harmed, but what if they were? Um, now we have to ensure that bus drivers need to be more prepared. So, you know, the short answer is crime in our youth um, and, 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 and that how that's impacting their education. Yes, so. delegate follow up question. What do you think accounts for that? Um, you know, we're trying to figure it out. We're having our third hearing in Judiciary Committee tomorrow. These interim meetings that we're having, that's what we are trying to figure out as legislators. Not sure if it's, it's, it's not one thing. It's trauma. It's maybe lack of resources. It's definitely, I believe, um, parents should be more involved. Um, and maybe some parents just work in trying to provide for their you know, children. And others may just don't know how. And maybe some just don't care. And so I think that it's um, not one issue. It's a multiple um, issues. It take, you know, our health and government operations, it take our appropriations to put money, it take our judiciary committee, you know, to find ways to hold those who commit crimes accountable. So it's a number of, you know, a myriad of issues. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to tackle as, as you know, public servants, as legislators. How do you deal with that? It's just not one. It's a lot of issues. Yeah, yeah. It's not a whole lot. Uh, uh, Senator, um, yeah, your thoughts on that? Like, what's the one issue that's within the K through 12 universe that's keeping you up at night the most? So well, Charles, again, thank you for having me on and uh, CSG as well. And hello to, to Delegate Tolls and thank her for um, her public service. You know, I think um, Delegate Tolls hit on one part for me that's part of a larger issue that I'm concerned about is just the inequity of everything that our, our children face, particularly for black and brown kids. Um, when I was either in the legislature working for the Obama administration, part of that time working at the Department of Education, everything that happens outside the schoolhouse um, impacts what happens inside. And so when Andrew talks about kind of the historic um, decline in terms of achievement, part of that obviously is COVID. De Delegate Tolls talked about crime. There's also health issues, homelessness that you mentioned, all of this stuff impacts um, what goes on for our kids inside their learning environment. So those are the things that that keep me up is just the inequities that so many of our kids face that really impacts how they learn day to day, really impacts what the teachers um, are engaged with each and every day in their classrooms. And whether it's crime, whether it's chronic absenteeism because the parents are either not caring or have other things that they do and they think once the kid leaves the house, yeah, they're going to school, but they're not. Um, so all of those things are really impacting the numbers that we're seeing. You know, one one uh, theme that threads together, which you're both saying, you know, like delegate tolls, you talk about like crime being that main concern. Uh, Senator Groff, uh, you talk about, uh, you know, inequity, like being a major concern. So, you know, it's lack of resources. It's um, it it is it it does kind of get back to um you know the growing diversity of of school systems of school districts of K through 12 education and so you know talk about like how much demographic changes here delegate dole starting starting with you especially in a very diverse 
um, an increasingly diverse state, uh, state like Maryland, how much uh, demography, the, the change in complexion of populations plays into all of this. So or do you mean in terms of geographics, like where you live in terms of or, in the state? Terms, in terms of like, you know, race, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how are the demogra the racial demographics, the changing, uh, you know, because school districts are becoming much more black and brown, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, how does that play into, or do you feel that that plays a factor into securing resources, needed resources for schools or for school districts, K through 12 systems that are faced with these challenges? You know, I think that we can certainly, you know, I mean, I represent in the state Prince George's County, which is, you know, the largest black county, um, you know, one of the, the largest and quite honestly, um, should should be or supposed to be the, you know, richest black county um, in the country or one of them. And um, in terms of wealth, but we still have these challenges. And I think what we see um, is a mixture of our, you know, you have black kids who I think it's not so much um, an issue of, I say black and brown, because we know it's a, it's a minority county, um, but really it's the equity issue um, as was indicated by Mr. Groff there. It was a, it's a, you know, equity, you know, concern, you have, and it's something that you and I talked about, we have our children, we have those who are can't afford it, do not put their kids in the public schools. Um, and because they say that the public schools, again, whether it's crime, whether it's overcrowding of schools, whether the resource is not up to date, whether their kids are not learning at the pace they should be learning and preparing for, you know, college and so forth. But um, it's a it's an issue of you have sort of what I have begun to understand is that you have children of the same sort of demographic background and those that are not, you may be in certain parts of the county that have better schools than other parts of the county. And so I think, again, it goes back into the equity issue of, yes, we're not going to escape the fact that race plays a card, but this is a minority county. So, you know, you you that that is a given you're going to have minorities in the school system so what we need to do again i go back to i feel very strongly about this is that we need to have parental engagement i like to look at my neighbors in washington dc what they have done um in terms of they have diversified that 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 city um you know a decade ago or 20 years ago the school systems were not as where people were like the school systems are bad and you had many things happen in the school system. But once they begin to change the demographics, you begin to see um, parents who are more involved. Maybe they have more time to be involved in their children's lives. And so what happens is you see um, a diversity of children in our school system. And I think that's what we need to really look at. How do you put a diversity of kids, those who are able to, you know, afford to go to private schools, but they're in public schools because they are able to contribute to the overall betterment of our schools when you have kids that are learning from each other of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And I think, you know, that that's where I think we see it in, an issue and where we need to have improvement is how you encourage those parents who can take their kids out of public schools to keep them in the schools and offer that diversity of, um, you know, social economics. Hey, uh, Senator, I don't know if you want to give some thoughts on that, you know, like these increasingly non-white majority BIPOC school systems, um, how much it's influencing the trajectory, the future of our K through 12 systems. Where, where do we go from here? Because well, Charles, I think to be fair, I mean, most urban school districts have been black and brown, um, probably since the Housing Act in the nineteen late nineteen sixties when there was white flight, mm -hmm. right? So the the to Delegate Tolls's point, you you've had minority or black and brown school districts for a long time. So the question is, what is new in terms of kind of performance and how kids are doing? I live in Prince William County, 40 miles south of district um, in Virginia. My son went to a predominantly black and brown high school that was really good and prepared him for the five seconds he spent in college before he decided to be a Marine. Um, but but he uh, he said, 
he thought that the the college he went to was easier than the high school mm-hmm. or with yeah the college was easier than the high school that he went to um and so to say that you know we have black and brown schools now and maybe that's the issue i don't think that's the case i, I do think again to delegate tolls who hit it right on the head is that you have this now um economic inequity within urban centers where if we have the opportunity we're going to send our kid um, and know about a charter school down the street we'll do that or if we have that extra money if we have that disposable income we'll do the private school thing or to your point to um, a point that Andrew made we'll just homeschool right And, and so I think what happens is we have students who are left um, in kind of, not, I wouldn't say bad schools, but schools that underperform with young teachers who are really struggling trying to find their way. And that's kind of where the district sends them. Um, and so those kids are kind of stuck there who don't have the other resources. That's when we're beginning to see poor school performance, particularly for those kids who are, are in poverty. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, Delegate, uh, you know, we we are seeing these trends. Um, I, I see it happening in Maryland, right? You know, in, in your state, uh, where families are moving towards uh, options, alternatives like homeschooling, more than either public or even private or or publicly funded uh, or or what are otherwise known as charter schools. So, how how is that impacting uh, a state, uh, a district like yours, where more and more families are opting for that, especially in the wake of COVID? Um, I, I don't, I think that, you know, we still are putting money into the schools because while you have a lot of, you know, if you have a, um, black stu- black parents who, if this was at, you know, an affluent black county, which it is, and you have black parents sending their school, their kids to, um, you know, charter schools or private schools, you know, Catholic schools um, or homeschooling, you still have an increase in um, the Latino community. And so that is that being a minority as well, the funding still needs to stay the same. Um, what we've seen on the floor, quite honestly, is a battle really between, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats in terms of, um, you know, vouchers um, and waivers into, um, and, um, in, into these, you know, private schools and charter schools, these, you know, charter schools um, in the state. And so um, the funding doesn't change because you still have an increase in the Latino community, um, which, you know, may not be able to, you know, have, have at, at this point have accumulated what, you know, Prince George's Black wealth has. And so the funding needs to stay the same. Um, but also I think you're seeing um, trying to put more, social programs in the school. So putting money into, you know, um, decreasing the class size a bit, giving teachers more raises, putting money into um, mental health services. So trying to increase the services and in an attempt to try to hopefully improve student outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Peter, um, speak on that. You know, this, uh, you know, this move towards, um, I know you're not in Maryland, so you're in another state, but um, you know, drawing from your experiences in Colorado when you were leading the state Senate, um, then also um, leading at the Obama administration on some of these issues. So, but w- what are these trends showing us? Um, where is this all headed? Well, I, there's there's a couple of things. One, one I think there is, when you think about book bans, CRT, which by the way is not done and K through 12 level. It's barely done in law schools. I went to a law school that didn't even teach it. So that's a red herring. But mm-hmm. there is an effort, I think, um, that's, and I'm a Democrat, so, and I'll be partisan for at least for this part. There is an effort, I think, within the Republican Party to um, to begin to dwindle down or maybe even um, extinguish the administrative state. So the ability of the administrative state to do what it needs to do to ensure that citizens have an adequate opportunity to excel, particularly those who are struggling, that includes K through 12 education. So this push for vouchers 
which on the surface sounds like a good idea. I'm going to give you $10,000 or $12,000, and you can take it to any school in the state that you want, whether it's public or private, it's, it's up to you to do. But then you begin to think about it. In Colorado, when I was in the legislature, passed a voucher bill um, that was found to be unconstitutional. Um, there was so many issues around it during the debate um, that, you know, at first I thought, well, maybe this is a good idea. And then you begin to think about it. And I could never get my arms around three things, the accessibility, the affordability, and the accountability. Once you give that money out to a private school, who are they accountable to, right? They're not accountable to the state because the state doesn't allow that. Um, if I give it to, if you give it to me in Prince William County right now, which is what Governor Youngkin had kind of talked about doing, had the election gone a different way, where would I take it? There were two private schools within maybe 15, 20 minutes of where we live, and we live kind of in the center of the county. So accessibility is an issue. Um, and then there's the affordability piece, right? So if I give you $10,000, that may not get me into Country Day X or private school Y or parochial school W, because that uh, tuition is going to be $15,000 and I don't have that disposable income. So what you're seeing, I think, is an effort to really destroy public schools as you look at Texas and other states really kind of aggressively moving in that direction. Um, and, and so I think that's part of the issue. The other part of the issue, I think, is for those of us, and I was a huge charter school supporter um, when I was in the legislature, I think we need to really transform public, public school choice and give parents a number of dif different options within the public school system. Um, and I've seen that work um, in Colorado. I've seen it work a little bit here in Virginia for what small pieces that we've had, but I, I worked around the country as a member of the Obama administration and then out um, kind of on my own working on the, these issues. I think those opportunities really give parents of color a unique option and it gives the public schools a unique option to kind of remake themselves, but keep those dollars within the district. Um, and so there, there's a lot of conversation about education reform but I think now that we have gotten into this incredibly partisan situation, you have a situation where there are folks um, who say we've got to destroy the administrative state. Um, and you can hear the former president who's campaigning again talk about that each and every day. And I think we have to be careful as we look around at the options that are out there for education. Yeah, I, I, I want to shift the conversation here a little bit, too, in terms of um you know, just solutions to a lot of these trends that we've identified, these challenges that we've discussed, right, Delegate? And um, in, in your mind, what are some of the potential new models out there that could work, right, towards helping, uh, you know, because we've identified a lot of challenges with uh, the current K through 12 apparatus. Uh, you know, there's obviously some some issues uh, some deficiencies that these systems are dealing with. So um, there's some help that these districts need. And what we're also seeing that some of these districts are operating rather well, but they could they, they could definitely use some help. They could definitely use some improvement. Um, it's not at all perfect, but uh, I'll start with you, Delegate, on this question about like just new models that you think could work or are there other creative, innovative education um, models or or ideas um, that you may have witnessed in Maryland that work um, that legislators right now in Annapolis are talking about that maybe um, should be introduced uh, to help improve uh, K through 12 systems in a state like yours? Um, well, you know, I don't really work very closely with, um, I, I do not work closely with in terms of the programmatic piece that is left up to our school systems to determine which programs they feel work, you know, best for them, the overall arching, you know, issues of school choice. Um, you know, that is again, um, as the Senator mentioned, the, these are, the, these are battles on the floor, um, you know, where even some Democrats may want to keep that option. Um, and others feel like those resources should go toward public schools where we're paying, where we are paying our tax dollars. And so in terms of 
delving into the weeds of, you know, the programs, I go back to the old adage that, listen, if you have parents that are involved in the school system, you can quickly fix that school system. Um, one of the things that I um, have been thinking of proposing is, you know, mandatory um, uh, volunteer hours for parents. I know in many of the private schools, um, they have volunteer hours for parents. They have to volunteer. I mean, something as small as 10 hours um, can make a difference if you, that shows your involvement in your child's school. And so I know that there have been models in um, private schools where you you know, come work a concession stand at a football game uh, for a couple of hours, you know, donate some 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 time in the classroom or go on a field trip. Something as simple as going on a field trip with your child can really make a difference in terms of their education. They feel like, hey, my, you know, my parents there, they're involved. Maybe it's better outcomes. The, the teachers feel like they can connect with the parents. But, um, you know, those simple things that I think can make move the needle a bit in terms of our children being um, having the resources and being properly educated and being comfortable in the schools. Um, also, they've taken counselors out of school systems and uh, many of the jurisdictions. I think they've begun to put them back in our schools. But mental health, um, I have a sorority sister who who is a principal um, at a she was previously a principal at a school in, in, in Washington, D.C. And literally we was on the phone. She was in tears because she was so frustrated that the fact that her kids come to school with trauma, they 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 come to school with the trauma. They're walking through neighborhoods with trauma. They are also having loved ones experience that. So they come into school with all of that. And they while they in school, they may have seen something that happens while they're on the playground. And so um, that is not only in the district, you may have those issues in Prince George's County and throughout the state of Maryland, you know, really um, throughout all of our jurisdictions, some, some of our children come to school for trauma for various reasons. And so to be able to address that, once you can at least work with them and understand that, you make it easier for them to learn better. Sometimes our kids come to school hungry. We should, number one, have pre pre um uh, pre K for every child. It shouldn't be, hey, if you are um you know a certain income, it should be every child should be able to begin to have pre K early as possible. Um, also having every child being able to have, you know, be able to have meals just having a decent meal, a breakfast, a lunch, and maybe even taking dinner home with them because they don't have food at home can make a difference in their learning. And so, you know, I don't think we need to recreate the wheel. I just think that we need to really amp up what we are doing and go back to that, you know, kind of old school thing, you know, where you had the lady in the neighborhood watching what's happening, you know, and, and giving our children the, the, the basic tools they need. Um, to, to perform at their best level in our school system. And so I don't need to recreate anything. We need to shift the money around um, and then ask those parents to really step up and be involved. Um, you know, even if it means they have to take off work or don't go into work, it really can make a difference in improving their, you know, children's education. Interesting, interesting. It's kind of drawn back from, you know, what we, what some of us grew up with, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, what some of us grew up with. Um, yeah, I said I want to ask you too about like what what are those creative, innovative models that you've seen out there? Because you've been across the country, you know, looking at them. You've been an uh, education advocate for for quite a long time. I did a, quite a bit of that work in the um, you know, once again, at, not in the both the Colorado House and the Colorado Senate. So, um, what what are you saying that's out there that that could potentially work? You know, there are a number of great models across the country that are in um, within public schools and within school districts that I think are working. And some of those are gonna be where um, you have charter schools that are allowed to do more things in your traditional public school. There is a network of schools called Learn for Life in California. Um, they're throughout, not only throughout California, but they have schools in Tennessee, um, Ohio, and a couple of, other, um, couple of other states as they look to expand. And what they do is they work with students who are either um, undercredited or those who are kind of the parenting teens who have the challenges that 
delegate tolls talked about that are bringing that trauma to school. But what it allows them to do is work with them in small pods, work with them um, throughout throughout the day, right? So they don't have just a traditional school day from seven to two, uh, but they are there early in the morning until late in the evening, allowing students to come in when it works for them. And then they have counselors on site to work with them. And they're, so there's this much smaller environment where we are seeing students excel. Um, Charles, and you know, because you've done a little bit of work with them as well as you've connected them with um, historically Black colleges and universities. And we're seeing students who didn't think they would go to college, who didn't think that college was anything that was meant for them, let alone graduate from high school. And we've seen schools like Learn for Life partner with HBCUs to ensure that they have that um, that college opportunity and that college experience. And so we've seen, and I've seen traditional schools um, who have filed for waivers and we created innovative schools and in um, Colorado, which is now modeled in 25 or, or 30 states in a variety of different ways. But it gives the same type of um, freedom and flexibility that traditional charters have to schools that are run by the district. So we move away some of the barriers that allow teachers to educate the kids that are right in front of them who are bringing that trauma in and allowing them to work with them um, on weekends, um, during the summer, um, whenever that student needs that assistance in school then is a much more um, kind of fluid situation for them, but they're still meeting state requirements, they're still passing state tests, and they're moving on to college and a career. So it, it's it's really about creating flexibility for those students and those educators to do what's needed for the children. And, it, you know, people like Learn for Life are saying what's, what we need to do is figure out what's in the best educational interest of our kids, um, as opposed to kind of what's in the best interest of adults in a system that may not work for them. It, uh, you know, I'm, I'm real curious about this too, and I wanna open it up to question. Oh, go ahead, delegate. No, I was just gonna add one thing. Um, I think the Senator brought up something. It's also, I wanted to kind of add on to that is that sure. we need to really um, take another look at our trade schools. I mm -hmm. mean, you, <laughs> these trades uh, get so, it's a great living um, being able to reinvest in that. You know, many years ago was, you know, I grew up where it was like, you better go to college, you know, uh, get a good, get, you know, get a good job um, and be burdened with student loan debt, <laughs> you know. And so um, from undergrad to law school, just go all the way, just have debt. And now the, you know, we've kind of gotten away from that, but we need to look at revisiting our trade schools and, and, and meeting, you know, our youth where they are. Everyone is not going to go to college. And with this student loan debt, you know, the talk of that, I know I talk to a lot of young people that are just like, I don't want to deal with that debt. And so trade schools offer a way to, they train, they, they, they train, you know, um, their employees up. You can, they'll give you all the tools you need and you um, come out once you have that skill making so much money. But if you encourage that more in the high schools, then they come out job ready, skill ready, where they just have to be refined based off whatever trade they go to. They go and learn that skill trade, but they have the basics when they leave high school. And also with our police, department and our fire departments um i'm hearing across the board that they are at a shortage they having a hard time hiring and so let's put those um in you know in our school system we have the we have our fire department that have you know um young people um training but it's only in two or three schools at least in my county um not sure if it's all throughout the state of maryland but encouraging those trades getting those fields where we're meeting our children where they are let's inspire them let's give them something you know that they would like to do let just as um peter said put it all on the adults um, and so bringing our trades back, um, and that is critically important. I think that's where we're headed, um, at least in Maryland. I'm hearing that talk throughout the country, even with the president. Mm -hmm. oh, Charles, just, and I know you want to open it up for questions, right. but just to, to put a point on it in terms of what the delegate just said, Learn for Life has a partnership with California's Department of Employment and Labor, whatever they call it out there, um, to partner with um, 
that partner with the state to ensure that if there are kids who want to go into the trade in workforce development, they allow them to do apprenticeships while they're in school. And so it's that type of innovation that I think we need that um, and in some schools, um, other kind of districts are beginning to see that, but there are multiple uh, charter schools that are doing that across the country, working with their states, figuring out what trades make sense for those students at that point. Because as she said, not everyone is going to go to college. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be ready to go, uh, but not everyone is going to make that uh, make that leap for a variety of reasons, particularly with regard to the debt and how much schools cost, Charles, as you're seeing with your freshman daughter. Um, so, that, um, so, you know, allowing students or allowing um, schools to work with states on workforce development and trades just makes a great deal of sense. And it, it's good to hear um, someone who is currently in office who has the ability to kind of create that gateway, um, kind of talk about that's something that needs to be done. Right. Uh, we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, have a few people here, um, include I, I do see uh, we have Connecticut uh, State Representative um, and also uh, Connecticut House uh, Deputy Speaker Geraldo Reyes. Uh, I think he's joining us right now. Uh, so it's good to see him. Uh, Representative Reyes, uh, Deputy Speaker Reyes, uh, good to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, so feel free if you have a question or a comment. Uh, even if you all want to kind of uh, offer any of your insights in this conversation, which is being recorded, by the way, we are recording this conversation. Uh, it will be shared on a number of platforms, uh, most notably uh, our Council of State Governments Eastern Region, primarily website at csg-erc.org. I will be sharing it on thebnote.com, which has a very large national audience. Uh, so they will be exposed to this very important conversation about K through 12 education. And we will be having some follow-up conversations uh, in the near and distant future. Uh, we also have the Chief of Staff to State Representative Misha Maynor um, in Georgia, representing uh, parts of Georgia. So uh, that's down in the South. And uh, But uh, we, we welcome those insights from uh, other regions as well, particularly since uh, our Council of Communities of Color is the only one of its kind out of the four CSG regions. So I uh, would, would love to hear any insights or any thoughts uh, from, uh, or any questions uh, as well from uh, from Tay, uh, from Representative Maynard's, uh, 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 Representative Maynard's Chief of Staff as well. So feel free to ask questions. And, uh, and we have Andrew Johnson on standby, on call. If, he's, if you have any questions for him, uh, he is the Council of State Government's Education Policy Analyst. Uh, so he gave a presentation earlier today. So we've been talking uh, during this conversation. I still have questions too. Uh, so we've been talking during this conversation and we'll end uh, shortly uh, with Maryland State Delegate Karen Tolles. Uh, she is also vice chair of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus. It's actually, it's the largest legislative black caucus um, out of all the 50 states, I'm told. So it is, uh, if I'm not- Yes, yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. I don't want to- um, impede over, over my good friend, Delegate Wells, who's the first vice chair. Ah, okay, second vice chair, okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, we have, we have all women. Uh, we have the chair, the Black Caucus, Janelle Wilkins from Montgomery County, Baltimore City, Delegate Wells, and me from Prince George's as second vice chair, all women um, at the top of the helm there. So we understand these issues regarding families and education. So definitely just want to shout them out really, really quickly. Sorry uh, to don't, interrupt. Oh, don't, 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 don't tell Delegate Wells that I omitted her as the uh, first <laughs> vice chair. <laughs> so, so you know uh, these AKAs trying to take over, so I don't want her. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Shout out to my Delta sister. So shout right. out to them. I don't want to, um, you know, those are my girls. Sure. Those are my sisters in service as well so thank you delegate appreciate you always appreciate you we're also uh delegate tolls um uh, she's very modest about this but she's uh adjunct faculty at Bowie state university uh notable uh hbcu historically black college in maryland uh so she teaches there and uh, also the joining first us hbcu in maryland i want to say the first hbcu in maryland. first hbcu in maryland that's right that's right uh thank you oh. for that yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, to, and it's growing. Uh, it's actually absolutely actually growing. Uh, and then uh, we've been uh, talking also on panel has been former Colorado Senate President Peter Groff. Um, he actually was uh, the very first, uh, the only uh, African American to hold that position. It made history there in 2008, becoming the Senate President. Uh, at the same time, there was actually a Black 
Senate president and a black House speaker happened at the exact same time in 2008 in Colorado. Little his little history fact toy there. And uh, while the first African American was being nominated um, at for uh, for the presidential ticket um, to the Democratic Party, um, while they were having uh, the Democratic National Convention in Denver, mm -hmm. Colorado, so it was like all this Black history was converging. Mm -hmm. In Denver, Colorado, all at once, <laughs> it was actually quite amazing to see. So um, he joins us here, a longtime education expert, education advocate. That's why he's a long, very, very good friend of mine too. Uh, but but I, I don't just have him on you because he's a good friend. But he he, when you need to know about K through twelve education, Peter knows it all, especially as a former um, undersecretary of education. Uh, at the in the Obama administration, so welcomed him on here as well. Needed to get his insights for this conversation. If anyone, uh, anyone have any questions, I'll uh, jump in because uh, I'm gonna hop off soon. Sure, go ahead, Ted. Uh, first of all, thank you all for having this meeting. It is obviously imperative considering everything that's going on. I just want to tip my hat to all the previous speakers. Um, to your point, I did just want to offer some insights from the landscape in Georgia just for you all's consideration. Uh, it may stick, it may not, but I just wanted to give you all some sort of objective read on what's going on with K through 12 here. Um, I'll say this, um, I'm a black parent. My son is in public school. Uh, I went to a public school. My mother went to a public school. Her mother went to a public school. And so uh, this is no tirade against public schools. I'll say that first. Um, but they have been trending downward. It's safe to say that in some areas across the country, they're failing. And I think that uh, there's plenty of blame to go around as to why and when and who. But I think uh, Peter hit the nail on the head that accountability is ultimately what people are going to start looking for. And I do think that parents move their children out of public schools as a measure of accountability. That is kind of the read that we're getting that parents are ultimately responsible for where their children are educated. And sans a new system or sans the needed resources, they take it into their own hands and they get ahead of the policy, they get ahead of the policymaker and they start deciding for their own family what's best. And I wanted to posit that first. And I'll say this about Representative Manners' administration. Uh, she ran as a Democrat. She inherited a district that had the most charter schools in the state of Georgia. And that put us on a unique trajectory wherein a Democrat has to grapple with that. And ultimately what we realize is regardless of what the money is being poured into the system, regardless of best practices, what we did last generation, parents are ultimately the ones who are going to decide where their kid goes to school. And not the teachers unions, not the public administrators, not the policymakers, the parents are going to decide. And so in navigating this, we have to stay close to the parents, right? It's gotten us in some hot water because what the parents are espousing as solutions may not tow party lines. And so we've gotten in a whole heap of trouble within, you know, caucuses and so on and so forth, navigating this. And so the only thing I would posit in ending is that, you know, parents are ultimately the ones in control and they are not partisan. They, their allegiance is to their children. And I'm just saying that objectively, not as a Democrat or as a Republican, but just learning that the parents are going to do what they think is best, regardless if it makes sense to us as policymakers and statesmen. And so, um, I, I sat in on this because uh, it, Representative Maynard's signature, you know, position is school choice. And a lot of people don't understand why, you know, as a former Democrat, she did that. Well, that was because her constituents, the parents are moving towards homeschool. They're moving towards public, private, you know, combo charter schools, if you will. And, you know, from what I'm listening, that is a phenomenon that is happening all across the country where parents are looking at more alternatives. And so I would encourage everyone to follow the parents where they're taking their children and try to take politics out of it. 
where it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes things are inherently political based on where you live or if it's politically expedient. And so um, just wanted to posit that um, everyone has added some profound, insightful tidbits. And uh, I'm learning with you all. And I just wanted to add that to the pot. So thank you all. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. Hey, Tay, you know what? I, I do want to do a follow-up conversation. Sure, sure. Part two conversation soon. So I'm hoping we can get some, let's let's get in touch so we can get uh, Representative Maynard um, on an, uh, on that next round table. Um, yeah, and I'm going to drop our office email in the chat and any uh, scheduling information, you can drop it there. Okay, excellent, excellent. I appreciate that, Tate. Those are some profound insights from uh, uh, from Representative. And listen, I'll tell you, the, the school choice thing is the biggest issue here right now. It's bigger than the economy. It's bigger than crime. Uh, parents are removing their kids from public schools at, in, if, based on where you sit, at an alarming rate. Really? And so we've had to rectify and square that with the the the, the monotony of policy making. And so I just wanted to offer that because you guys are wondering how it's going in region to region and region is is the hottest issue in Georgia right now. So. All right. Good. Now, thanks so much. Uh, that's from uh, Rep State Representative Georgia State Representative. Uh, Misha Maynard's uh, chief of staff, uh, Tay, joining us uh, right now. Uh, Representative Reyes. Uh, Mr. Deputy Ellison, Reyes, thank you for recognizing me. Too. Good afternoon, everybody. Always good to see you, Mr. Groff. Good afternoon, good everybody. You. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you know, education, my God. Uh, it's it's it, There's just so much going on under that heading of education. And when we, uh, here in Connecticut, uh, seems to me like, one of the biggest fights, uh, and I've already heard a few people mention it going back and forth, uh, depending on what state you're in, uh, charter schools are public schools, but they're treated uh, differently here in Connecticut. The, the, battle, uh, the battle line seems to have been drawn. Uh, not, only how we not only how we differently pu uh, fund charter schools, but actually even worse than that, uh, Pretty much excluding and not even uh, uh, not even like closing our mind to and not even expanding on charter schools when obviously this is what people, uh, as the young man just said, uh, Tay just said that the parents want the charter school option. They want the option. Uh, and the fight here in Connecticut is for uh, more charter schools. And uh, it seems like we're putting up uh, more hurdles and higher walls and more, you know, more policies and regulations. And uh, so instead of the child being the child and the child's education being the up the forefront, it's politics and which mayor wants it, which board of education wants it, which uh, board of education is voting for it. And it, it's really we're losing sight of declining grades, poor math scores, poor reading scores. And at the end of the day, the parents are ultimately responsible for their children's education as the word accountability comes in. I don't fault any parent that wants to take their child out of public school. I don't because they're, they're, the, the model has been proving uh, over and over that the scores are not improving, even though we're putting in a record amount of dollars in, in I'll, and I'll say in the state of Connecticut. Secondly, I wanted to add we saw some of the uh, concerns of parents actually finally being addressed and listened to and heard when we, we in Connecticut for the first time had two people of color uh, chairing the education committee here in Senator Doug McCory and uh, uh, House Representative Robert San Sanchez. So it was the first time that we had two men of color actually chair the education department, which was, which was profound. And they were able to make some changes and at least bring Bring us to the table. Number one, number two, have these these hard, difficult conversations about failing schools and failing public school policies. So you know it it it's very important. Senator McCory still stands, uh, still is chairing the education committee. Uh, our other our House representative right now is member uh, is Jeff Curry, uh, but he's been very progressive and very open minded. So uh, hopefully Connecticut is uh, starting to make that term, but we are definitely in a uh, quandrum when it comes to public schools and charter schools. And it's, 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 it's sad that we don't see it as what's best for the children as opposed to what's best for politics. Charles, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, thank you, Deputy Speaker uh, Reyes for those uh, insights, those remarks. Uh, we're gonna be ending this very shortly. Uh, I, I just wanted to see if uh, there were any 
any thoughts or any responses to that would uh, Representative Maynard's chief of staff was saying earlier on, and Deputy Speaker Reyes was saying, one delegate. Oh, you on mute, delegate. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I just think, you know, each state is different. So each state has, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, their model and, and ways in which they have to get policy through, legislation through, um, um, as indicated. You know, not only are we the largest Black caucus in the state of Maryland, I mean, I'm sorry, in the country, um, but we have, you know, Democrats outnumber Republicans. Um, and so, you know, we work closely together and we're trying to, we try to find common ground. Um, education is always going to be, you know, it's two sides of the coin. You have Democrats that want choice and, and you have, you know, um, the Democrats controlling the purse strings and, and um, because we are in the majority um, but you also have to look at, you know, really what we need to do to improve our educational system, because this is this this is where your dollar, you know, goes. And so we do have a responsibility. The people care about crime and education. Um, and so I just think that we just have mm -hmm. to, you know, find ways to fix them, um, recognizing that each state is different. Um, and um, let's try to find common ground. I know that sounds like a politician, but it's, it's really the case. 50 states, 50 different ways of doing things. Um, so, you know, that's why we need CSG and other organizations to help give us ideas and perspective on how to, you know, find the best way to move the needle. Yeah, and this uh, this was this definitely um was was a good primer on a lot of levels for for that conversation. Uh, Peter, if you wanted to end some some end thoughts. Sure, just real quickly, I think. Um what the deputy speaker mentioned and what Tay mentioned earlier um, is that parents want their kids in the best situation so that the school can bring the best out of them. They don't care if it's a public school. They don't care if it's homeschool. They don't care if it's online school, if it's a traditional public school. What is the best educational outcome for my kid? And let's put them there. You know, Again, I live in Virginia and the bulk of the time that the kids were in school, uh, they were in public schools um, until they went off to college and then went to private schools and my son went to a, um, a public university. But the the question for us and for me and my wife was that, is this the best fit for them? It didn't really matter what the school was. And so to the deputy speaker's point, um, if the parents are saying, this is what we want, um, as a representative, as a senator, you are then obligated to figure out how does that fit within the state scheme, within the state's budget, because this is what my constituents want. And I think that's what we're seeing. The hardest fights I had in the legislature was my support of alternatives within the public school system with the unions and with my own caucus, actually. Um, but it was the parents in my district in Northeast Denver who said, I want more of this. I want more options. I'm tired of sending my kid to a school uh, that's not working. And most often that was a traditional public school. We have to figure out what policies are in the best educational interests of the child. If we continue to do that, then we're going to be on the right side of, of this conversation. Yeah. Um I, unless there's, uh, I don't know if there's any other thoughts. I'm gonna, we went a little bit over time. I said, really appreciate everyone uh, staying on board with us uh, for this very important conversation on K through 12 education. Uh, and I also wanna, once again, I wanna give a, a word of praise to our, uh, our Council of State Governments Education Analyst, Andrew Johnson, who was on earlier, gave some great, a great overview. Andrew, thanks so much once again. Um, and if you'd like to touch base with him to see what legislatures are up to uh, on this topic of education, as you just heard, like you heard um, the chief of staff of one uh, particular state legislator saying that that is like, like education uh, and, you know, more specifically school choice, you know, being like the number one topic in that particular state. But um, you can go uh, reach out to Andrew at ajohnson at csg.org. What I found very fascinating too and wonderful about this conversation is we had a lot of, a lot of good state representation on here. We had, uh, we had a chief of staff of a state representative, for example, just now from give some uh, great comments from the South. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got Deputy Speaker Reyes uh, in the North, in the Northeast, Upper Northeast in Connecticut. Uh, we've got 
a, a north-south border state like Maryland, uh, Delegate Tolls, and then we have Senator Groff, uh, who is representing uh, a major state out west, right? You know, so we got well, some great regional representation on this conversation. Uh, and I really did appreciate that, giving us a, a, a variety of perspectives on what is truly an important issue, and especially to parents. Uh, so, Deputy Speaker Reyes, really thank you for joining. I know you got a busy schedule. Thanks so much for uh, for jumping in uh, at the last minute like that. So, I'm Charles Ellison. Uh, thank you for joining uh, joining our exclusive webinar. Once again, this has been uh, recorded, uh, and it will be shared to uh, a large audience of people. Uh, you'll be able to find it at csg-erc.org or csg-erc.org uh, to watch the entire conversation. And uh, we'll have it on some other platforms as well, probably on YouTube and thebnote.com. I'm Charles Ellison. I've been your moderator. I'm director of the Council of Communities of Color for Council of State Governments, Eastern Region. And uh, we'll see you at the next webinar, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.